this was the area right here with this nice topography, well-drained topography, if you will, that caused my soil to migrate downhill when I was doing invasive tillage. Uh, I knew that that was not good for organic matter. Uh, I had worked with my students to do experimentation on uh, what happens when we put stuff in the soil and watch it degrade. You know, we buried apples, we buried dead snakes, we buried all kinds of stuff and then came back a few months later and checked out what was going on. And we found that nature is a powerful decomposer. But that leads us to understand that if nature is a powerful decomposer, we are taking carbon, which is all of this residue that you see, and we're decomposing it, and that releases CO2 into the atmosphere, rather than keeping it in the soil or on the soil for enhanced organic matter or enhanced erosion protection. So over the years, I have watched my soil become more and more stable. Uh, the scientific aspect uh, was even brought home to a greater degree when some Carlton students came out with their soil respiration equipment and put their little sniffers, I call them, on the ground. And they were able to quantify the amount of CO2 coming off of a piece of ground that I just recently tilled compared to ground that was left no-till and very little CO2 emission on ground like this. But where ground had been tilled, um, it, was, it was pretty amazing. And with, with regard to that same issue, uh, a USDA and Iowa State experiment some years ago in Fayette County, Iowa, demonstrated that uh, one acre of soil tilled with a moldboard plow could emit up to 2,200 pounds of CO2 in 24 hours. That's a metric ton. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't put it in a jar, you can't uh, really quantify it, but when you have the equipment to measure, then we have the science that tells us uh, yeah, tillage is a great way to volatilize our carbon and send it off into the atmosphere. On the opposite side of that, we find that farming is a great way to sequester carbon. So our ability to do something about carbon in the atmosphere uh, is really lying squarely on the shoulders of agriculture. And we need to begin thinking seriously about what we can be doing to address that problem. And for those who say, well, it's my land, I should be able to treat it the way I want to, I tend to think forward and look at the little ones that we're holding in our arms now, because some of them are going to grow up and they want to farm, and they're going to have to have soil that isn't totally wasted because somebody was impatient and was in it for just their own interests. So I've seen this soil become stable. Uh, science has uh, helped me understand through the work of my student uh, workers that come here uh, to do scientific research on organic matter. And they basically verify the idea that if you leave soil alone, and let the organic matter build, it, it, uh, it does its magic on its own. Uh, secondly, if we leave the soil alone, there are processes that work to hold the soil together nicely to develop soil aggregation. So I like to see my soil crumble into pieces or feel like a piece of chocolate cake instead of a handful of chocolate cake mix, which is pretty powdery. It'll blow away, it'll wash away. 
Um, but if our soil is stable with uh, good soil aggregation, that's good. Soil aggregation is made up of sugars that uh, you know, plant exudates that hold the soil together, um, various kinds of uh, critters crawling through the soil. I just lump it all into one classification. I call it worm snot. It's what holds the soil together. And then we have uh, something that is uh, also of important in that importance, and that is bulk density. So if we think of a cubic centimeter of soil, and we weigh it, bulk density tells us what it weighs. And heavily compacted, heavily tilled soil will weigh more per cubic centimeter than soil like this that has been left undisturbed for perhaps 23 years. And that again was brought to me by wonderful students who knew the scientific um, processes to find that out and to help me understand it. So I'm still a, a learner and uh, students often say, gosh, it must be really cool to have been farming as long as you have because you know just about everything there is to know. And I say, no, just the opposite. Farming goes on, and I know now that there's so much I don't know. So it's up to you people to learn it and practice it and make a difference, not me. <laughs> and then once in a while I tease them, I say, I'm old, I'm Norwegian, I'm close to death, and you can't hurt me. <laughs> so, uh, a real a scary but eye-opening situation was when uh, a landowner and I agreed that a field needed tile. Uh, because the soil was not very productive, it, was, it had been pounded many times because it was wet, and on my watch, I just was not comfortable continuing to treat the soil that way. So we agreed to tile the piece, it was 20 acres. And uh, after the tiling was done, we needed to straighten out all the tile runs. So my son uh, took our, our only tillage tool and tilled the soil. I mean, he tilled it and tilled it and tilled it. Well, we had data on that field from three years previously from the students doing their soil quality research. And two young women came in and sampled that field. It was a 20 acre field and they took over 200 soil samples. So we know that their science is valid. And they found that that one significant tillage event reduced the soil organic matter on that field by a half a percent in one year. So uh, that, was, that was both disturbing and it was eye-opening. So that to me was a pivotal finding that uh, gave us evidence that yeah, tillage does do things that are, are not good. Uh, a second uh, eye-opening uh, occurrence was uh, when a student did an experiment on uh, no-till fields and fields that were heavily tilled. What she did was to build nice little weirs and then buried a bucket in the ground so she could catch runoff. And she found that the heavily tilled field had significant water and soil in the bucket after a rain. And on the no-till field, uh, we found that um, most, of the, most of the water had infiltrated. That was, that was the second one. The third one occurred just last summer with a St. Olaf research colleague. And she uh, did uh, an experiment on infiltration. So she took her infiltrometer, which was a coffee can with both ends cut out of it, and snuggled it into the soil about right out here, and poured in 300 milliliters of water. 
and it took 18 seconds for that water to disappear. We went to another field that had had significant tillage uh, and um, invasive, heavy tillage, and then rolling the ground to pulverize it. Same technique, same amount of water, took four minutes and 40 some seconds for 300 milliliters of water to infiltrate. So when we have rainfall, my thinking, when I listen to a farmer say, oh gosh, we got this wonderful inch and a half rain. And my next question that I would like to ask is, you got an inch and a half of rain. How much did your field capture? How much ran off? I think I can say with good scientific basis, I capture most of my rainfall, except when we get a five and a half inch in two hours, like you see here. So those three uh, are, are pivotal events in my um, decision-making about farming and, and what I know.